Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Um, some of you guys have actually been here before. Welcome to Dinner Disrupted, a partnership of public li libraries taking action. Um, dinner here for Dinner Dis Disrupted, we want to encourage our patrons, particularly in Fairfield and New Haven County, counties, to play a more active role in their food system by engaging in collective discussions and actions focusing on food security, climate change, land use, and agriculture. My name is Kathleen Fife. Um, I'm one of the adult services librarians here at Trumbull Library, alongside my partner, um, Amara Johnson. And we've done a couple of things. We've talked about how restrictive zoning laws can increase admissions and exacerbate uh, global warming. We've talked about food security um, in communities, um, planting you know, the perfect vegetable garden. Uh, we've also talked about the changing landscape here in Connecticut. And we also invited already a couple of um, book authors um, to talk about um, uh, the series. Um, what, is, what causes climate change? What are the effects of climate, uh, climate change? How do communities understand their influence on climate and climate's influence on them? This evening, we learn the human impact and consequences of climate change for the, for the environment in our lives. Tonight, I'm honored to have Professor Jason Smearden, a Lamont research professor at Lamont Doherty Earth, uh, Earth Observatory of Columbia University, who's gonna provide an accessible overview of, of the science behind climate change and a clear-eyed assessment of the potential risks ahead. Jason is. Jason also holds appointments um, at Columbia University as an Earth Institute faculty member and as co-director of the undergraduate program in sustainable development. He teaches courses on climate, environmental change, and sustainable development to undergraduate and graduate students. Jason also lectures widely in public and private settings on the subject of climate change and its social dimensions. Jason's Research focuses on climate variability and change during the past several millennia and how past climates have helped us understand future climate change. He publishes widely in the scientific literature on paleoclimate re reconstruction um, techniques, the dynamics of past climate change and vari variability, and, and on assessing climate ma um, model simulations of the past and future using of paleoclimatic um, um, information. Uh, in 2013, Jason served on a served as a contributing author to assessment report five of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. He's also um, co author of climate change, the science of global, oh, excuse me, of global warming, and our energy uh, feature. So I just want to welcome Jason. <laughs> Um, thank Thanks. you so much, Jason, for being here and for sharing um, your knowledge with us. I think this is a really important conversation um, talk to have um, in this it, within the series because you know it's a it's one of those uh, words we hear all the time, and it's good to have at this point um, in our series to kind of have a little bit more of understanding what climate change is. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kathleen, and and thank you to the Trumbull Libraries for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm really excited to talk to your patrons and uh, give you a little bit of background on climate change generally. Uh, it sounds like you've had some really interesting discussions about some of the impacts of climate change and how it relates to other uh, social and economic systems and the importance thereof. And so this will be a nice way of contextualizing some of that at a global scale in terms of how we know what's happening and what we expect to happen as a consequence of our continued greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So I'm going to take you through um, a very quick primer and then have more of a discussion about what the future might hold and, and how to think about that moving forward. Um, I can actually see questions. Kathleen, if there are questions in the chat or in the Q&A that you want to bring up, 
while I'm presenting, it seems like we have a nicely sized group so that I can address questions uh, throughout if you want to flag me if there are anything, sure. uh, if anything comes up. Otherwise, my intention is to leave plenty of room at the end for questions as well. So I'm going to start with the punchline. The earth is warming and we're causing it. Um, depending on what circles you hear uh, this issue discussed in, that may sound uh, commonplace or it may sound uh, more blunt and um, convinced than you have heard in other discussions. But the scientific perspective on this is very established. It's not debated. Uh, it's widely held within the scientific community that this statement is true. In fact, people have studied this. So this is um, actually one of my favorite papers. The title is the title of my slide, Consensus on Consensus, a synthesis of consensus estimates on human-caused global warming. And what each of these pie charts represent are different studies. So this was a, a study that looked at all of these studies uh, and evaluated what people had come up with for this consensus estimate within the scientific literature. So whether it's writings within papers, whether it's surveys of scientists, and all of these studies showed that well over 90% uh, of scientists agree with the statement that the earth is warming and we're causing it. And in fact, this is ordered such that as you go from the bottom left up to the top left, uh, you're getting in closer and closer to exclusively climate scientists. So not the scientific community as a whole, but people whose expertise is closer and closer to this issue. And as you get closer and closer to the scientific community, specifically the folks who are studying climate change, that number gets closer and closer to 100%. So this consensus is something that's widely held and it's, it's actually been studied um, across many different studies and shown that a wide degree of agreement within the scientific literature and within the scientific community agrees with this statement. So what I wanna do is, is actually walk through three supporting questions related to that. Essentially ask the questions that allow us to know what we know about this statement that I've just made. And so I'm gonna break that down into, into first question one, which is, is CO2 and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increasing? So there's a couple things worth noting before I jump into that. The first is when you think about the atmosphere, it may seem vast and, and tremendous in size relative to um, you know, our, our size and scale as humans walking around on the surface of the planet, but the atmosphere is actually a very thin veneer on the surface of the planet. So if the earth was a basketball, the solid earth was a basketball, the thickness of the atmosphere would be about three sheets of paper. If the earth was a car, a, a regular sized two-ton car, the mass of the atmosphere would be about the mass of a paper clip. So when you, when you look at the scaling from that perspective, it becomes easier to imagine how human activities and other natural activities uh, for that matter can influence the atmosphere in significant ways and have the kind of impact that we're seeing uh, humans to have on the atmosphere presently. So how do we know uh, what the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is? Well, there's different ways that we can do that. And when we look over long time scales, so this inset here goes back 800,000 years up through present. And the vertical scale is the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down. These are the ice age cycles that we've seen uh, on the planet over the last roughly million years. But you can see that, that uh, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which um, is measured in parts per million, uh, so this would be 0.03% of CO2 in the atmosphere, then it hasn't changed between about 300 parts per million and about 180 parts per million. The average CO2 in the atmosphere last year was 416 parts per million, so a significant increase. I should say for parts per million, it might seem um, hard to imagine that such a small trace amount of something can actually influence planetary temperatures. But the analogy I always draw is that if someone my size drinks uh, two beers, my blood alcohol content will be 0.04%, so roughly 400 parts per million. And that's right, the four, uh, 400 parts per million alcohol is right when the body starts to feel the effects of alcohol. So it's another measure of a system where a very small, tiny amount of something can cause huge systemic impacts. Of course, the human body and the atmosphere are very different, but the reason why this concentration is so important in the Earth's atmosphere is because CO2 um, is very important in how it interacts with radiation in the atmosphere and causes um, what we know as long wave radiation, which we emit back towards space to be held closer to the uh, surface of the planet. So from these 
and I should say, so over the last 800,000 years, the way that we get that information is from things like ice cores. So this is an ice core that was taken out of um, a um, ice sheet in Greenland. Uh, it is mined for the tiny bubbles that it contains, and those bubbles contain little bits of the Earth at of the Earth's atmosphere when the ice was formed. And that allows us to go back uh, this 800,000 years and estimate CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We can use other means to go back farther. And just to give you some perspective about that 400 parts per million, um, it's been three and a half million years since the Earth's atmosphere was at, had that level of CO2. So you have to go back three and a half million years ago to find uh, a time when the Earth had that level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this other number on here is 200,000 years, which is roughly the um, amount of time that Homo sapiens have existed on this planet. So we are the first humans in the history of Homo sapiens to have experienced uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere of over 400 parts per million, because uh, you have to go back before we, our species even existed to find the previous time when, when 400 parts per million existed. But we can, of course, measure CO2 in the atmosphere as well, and we've been measuring it uh, directly at this observatory in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, since 1959. And I showed you that ice core record that estimates during the 18th century before the Industrial Revolution, we were at about 280 parts per million. When uh, this record began in 1959, the amount, the average amount in the atmosphere was 316 parts per million, so a 13% increase. And then just last year, as I mentioned, we were at 416 parts per million. So from 59 to 21, a 32% increase. If you add them together, we're just shy of a 50% increase since before the Industrial Revolution. So it's increasing, and it's increasing at a more rapid pace as we um, increase our emissions into the atmosphere. So CO2 is going up faster over the last decade, for instance, than it was during the decade when this record was started. So those are the measurements that we have that tell us CO2 is going up in the atmosphere, along with a, a lot of other things. The second question that I want to address is whether or not the Earth is warming. And just like CO2, we have direct measurements of temperature that go back to the mid um, 1800s, roughly. So this is one of the estimates of temperature compiled by uh, NASA. Starts in 1880. And you can see that global temperatures have gone up. They've gone down. But overall, the trend is toward uh, more and more warmer temperatures uh, with time. In fact. Over this time, temperatures have increased uh, by about a degree Celsius. And the other way of putting this, as you, as you look at this record, is the 10 warmest years on record are listed here along the right side of this panel. So with the exception of uh, the 2010 and 2005, eight of the warmest 10 years have been in the last decade. Uh, and that when you look at this time series, it's not surprising. It's going up, up, up. And as you might expect, uh, the most recent years are the warmest on that record. So we're continuing to march up. The Earth is getting warmer, and it's clearly measured by these global temperature estimates that we have. If a degree C of warming doesn't sound like much, uh, let me just put this in context. If human height in the United States, which uh, our average human height for women and men is uh, five feet four inches for women and five feet nine inches for men, if height in the United States increased by the same proportional amount as temperature has increased globally, we would all be walking around as an average of 6'5 and 6'11. So that is definitely a change that you would notice, uh, even though in the sense of global temperatures, it might not be something that is easy to perceive when we have changes from year to year or season to season that are much larger than that. But we're talking about averages here and just like your experience with people, they can be tall, they can be short, but there's an average. And uh, if, again, if that proportional amount uh, that we have seen in temperatures had increased height by the same amount, uh, we'd all be playing for the Knicks. Okay. Um, but the other point that I want to make about this is that what I showed you was observational temperature records taken from an array of observational locations around the globe. But that's not the only thing that we have that tells us whether or not the Earth is warming. In fact, there are lots of observations that are consistent with the idea that the Earth is warming. Snow cover is reducing, glacier volume is reducing, the ice sheets are reducing in their mass, uh, air temperatures over the expanse of the, the lower layer of the atmosphere are increasing, 
Water vapor is increasing in the atmosphere. As the atmosphere gets warmer, it holds more moisture. That's going up. We're seeing sea surface temperatures go up, sea ice go down, ocean heat content go up, sea levels go up. All of these things are consistent uh, with the idea that the planet is warming and we're seeing increases in the amount of energy, ultimately, uh, that's available at the Earth's surface um, across a lot of different observations. So the Earth is warming and CO2 is increasing. But that brings us to this causal question. Is increasing CO2 causing the warming? So this is the last question that I want to address in this part. Um, the first thing I'll show you is going back to that ice core record. So you've already seen the CO2 in this, in this figure that goes up, it goes down, it goes up, and up ultimately to the 400 and, uh, well, this was 20, 2020. Uh, I didn't update this for 2021, but 416 is, is the most recent uh, average in 2021. But the other figure, the other data in here are the light blue lines, which are temperatures. And what this is showing is over the last 800,000 years, when CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. When CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. Now, there's some interesting questions about the causal relationships there, but the important part here is that they really march in lockstep. And so when we're seeing CO2 in the atmosphere go up so rapidly, uh, based on this historical evidence, we would expect temperatures to respond in kind. But we don't just have observations. We have a lot of established um, physical theory and, and chemical theory about how this all works. So our understanding about climate didn't start just a couple decades ago um, out of some conspiracy. But our understanding of the climate system is actually built on well over 100 years of scientific thought and discovery. So Joseph Fourier was one of the first people to write on this. He wrote a paper in 1827 on the temperatures of the terrestrial sphere and in interplanetary space, where he was the first to propose that CO2 uh, and other constituents in the atmosphere might set the temperature of the Earth. Uh, Eunice Newton Foote is somebody who was just recently discovered. She was a suffragist, grew up uh, in upstate New York, but was also a citizen scientist and did some of the first experiments to show that CO2 and other trace gases in the atmosphere interacted with electromagnetic radiation. She wrote a paper in 1856, Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. And Samante Arrhenius wrote a paper in 1896 where he effectively created the first climate model uh, and created the first estimate of how much the temperature of the Earth might change um, with a doubling of CO2. So this is, this is 19th century work that uh, has been built on for well over a century. But the point is, is that our understanding of climate is rich and goes back a long time. And people writing, uh, you know, in the 19th century when um, there, there weren't the political circumstances that surround this discussion at the time, were saying CO2 probably has an influence on the climate. Uh, and so I think that's an important perspective to keep in mind. But the last thing that I want to say about this causal connection is that we do have a lot of basic understanding uh, of how the physics and the chemistry of the climate system work. And we can build that all into climate models, which are basically big accounting machines. We divide space up into uh, cubes that represent air and water and land surface. And we build all of the physics and chemistry as best as we understand it into these climate models. It all represents just one giant uh, string of compu computer code. But with these models, we can run different uh, experiments with the climate that obviously we can't do in the real world because the climate is too vast. Uh, well, we're, we're running one giant experiment on the climate system right now, uh, but we can't run a bunch of other experiments. This is the one that we've got. Uh, but climate models allow us to do a lot of different experiments. And what I'm going to show you here is the results of a lot of different experiments with a climate model, with a collection of climate models, where we build into the climate models the different things that can cause climate to change, both natural and human in origin. And what I'm showing here is the observational temperature records that I've already shown you, those GIST temperature records that go back to 1880. And I'm going to start the animation. And as the animation moves forward, you're going to see climate model simulations with just first natural changes. So these are the orbital changes, the uh, relationship of the Earth to the sun. This is changes in solar luminosity. So the sun gets brighter, it gets dimmer. This is volcanic activity. All of these are natural features. None of them show this pronounced warming toward the end of the century. And when you put them all together, you get an estimate for the natural factors that cause climate to change. 
They cause some changes and they match some of the wiggles, but certainly not the increasing temperatures that we see at the end of the, um, the century. Now here are all the human components, changes in ozone competition. You just saw land use change. This is changes in industrial aerosols that reflect sunlight and actually cool the planet. And here come the greenhouse gases. So now if you run all of those out again and you put them together, you'll see the, the natural component or the, the human factors and their role in changing climate. And then to get everything, we put them all together. So the human factors and the natural factors. But what you should take from this simulation is that with the natural factors alone, there's no way that you can match the observational temperature record over the last, let's say 50 years. It's only with the inclusion of the human factors in these climate model experiments that we come uh, as close as we do and actually do a very good job if you look at the overall comparison uh, with matching these, this warming in the latter part of the century. So all of these components cause climate to change, but only with the human factors can we match the observational record over the last 50 years in particular. All of that to say is CO2 is going up, temperatures are increasing, and the greenhouse gases increases in the atmosphere are what's causing the warming. The earth is warming and we're causing it. Okay, now I wanna make a few points about the present. We've done the past, this is the present, then I'll be talking about the future in a second. The simple point that I wanna make the, in, in the present is climate change is here. I think we're all aware of the fact that as we look around uh, where we live, our communities, things are changing. And that is consistent with scientific findings that can attribute the changes that we're seeing to human activities. Uh, and uh, an understanding that what we're seeing now is very consistent with the projection, predictions that were made as long ago as 40 or 50 years about what we might expect under a climate that's being changed by increasing CO2. So I can't go into all of those things, but I just want to make the point by saying that these, these changes in climate are costing us something. And in this case, they're costing us money. So this is um, an estimate of the billion dollar disaster events by year going back to 1980 up through 2021. And the coloring here represents different events, severe storm counts, tropical cyclones, droughts, wildfires. You can see, for instance, the greens are really increasing. So we're seeing more and more severe storms. We're seeing some really massive tropical cyclone damage. All of these things um, are happening. And when you add them all up in terms of their impact on um, costs in the United States, we're seeing them cost more and more with time. And so this is just one measure, but shows in aggregate all of these different events that cause natural disasters, cause damage to infrastructure, cause human lives to be lost. Um, and in this particular measure of dollars, you can see that very clearly that as all these events are incurring and increasing, uh, those, the, the number of events are going up and the costs are increasing. Okay, so some context from the past, a reminder that climate change is happening now, it's not just something happening in the future, but what about the future? What can we say about the future? Well, the difficult thing about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so it's, it's hard to, to predict. And there are th reasons that make it hard to predict that have nothing necessarily to do with climate. We don't know what kind of energy that we're going to generate in the future. We'd like to think that we might generate more renewable energy, but that mix still remains to be seen. We don't know how we're going to use that energy in the future. We don't know how countries will continue to modernize and develop. We don't know how many of this there will be in the future. We have projections, but we don't know how many people there will be um, on this planet um, over the next several decades with any, um, well, with a great degree of accuracy. So there are a lot of those socioeconomic factors that we don't know about in the future. And the way that we handle that um, when we make projections of the future is to say, we're gonna create different scenarios. The best we can do is say, well, things could work out like this, they could work out like this, and they could work out like this. And each of those different pathways would result in different emissions pathways, which would result in different amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so I'm showing you the projections here with climate models. So the way to look through this figure is these are those observational temperatures that I've shown you in several slides. And then the, the colored lines here represent the beginning of different model simulations. And each model simulation represents 
um, different scenarios for the future. The blue line is an aggressive mitigation scenario where we really try to reduce our emissions into uh, the future. And the red line is sort of a worst case scenario. We just burn baby burn into the future without any restrictions. So there's a few things to note. First of all, if we look at the difference between this blue curve and the red curve, the difference is about three tenths of a degree Celsius versus almost five degrees Celsius. So a wide range in this pathway and the choices that we make along this pathway versus this pathway. The other thing that you'll note around these curves is the paler, is the paler space around each of these darker lines. What that represents is the range of different estimates from different models. There's about 20 to 30 modeling centers internationally that have constructed their own climate models. They all make different decisions about how to make them, what to put into them, and then they run the same experiments. And so one model might come here and a little bit colder, and one model might suggest that the future is going to be a little bit warmer for this same scenario. But what I want you to understand is that the range here is what we would call the scientific uncertainty. It's the range that we get from all the different models that we use and the uncertainty about how to build them. And this is sort of the range that we get um, around this red curve, which is the average of all the results. And you can see that range is about a degree or so. But as I mentioned, the decision uncertainty associated with these different pathways is much longer. So what that should tell you is that our understanding of the future has much more uncertainty associated with what we do than what we understand about the science. What really matters about how the future is going to unfold is what we decide to do relative to any uncertainty that we have about the scientific um, projections of these changes into the future. So I want to pick up on this uh, 4.8 degrees C and just give you some context of that worst case scenario of warming. So the last glacial maximum was when uh, I showed you the curve where coldest point uh, of our planet about 21,000 years ago. It was the height of the last glacial uh, period and there were vast ice sheets covering much of North America and Europe. In fact, Manhattan was the termis, terminus of the Laurentide ice sheet and it came down to Long Island and the end of uh, Manhattan Island. And at that time, um, there were a couple hundred feet, likely a couple hundred feet of ice built up at the end of uh, Manhattan here. Probably not as tall as the Freedom Tower, but several hundred feet of ice right at the terminus here. And the difference between the present day and that last glacial maximum was about four to five degrees C colder. So when you think about what a five degree change in global temperature represents, in the opposite direction, it resulted in massive ice sheets and ice covering all of Manhattan and much of Long Island um, as a consequence of cooling in the opposite direction. So we're talking about potentially a worst case scenario if we burn baby burn and really follow that worst case scenario pathway of an ice age of change in the opposite direction. And that should give you a sense of the scale of the changes that we're talking about here. Rates are also important. So coming out of that last glacial maximum, we, we warmed very quickly into the current uh, or the just past period, the Holocene, we're now in the Anthropocene, but uh, it took several thousand years to come out of that uh, period that was five degrees cooler and warm up to roughly present day. It, it was a very rapid change, but if that rate of change is a pedestrian walking three miles per hour, the rate of change that we're projecting along that worst case scenario to the end of this century would be like passing that pedestrian uh, going in a car between 160 to 300 miles per hour. So this is blazingly fast change. And the reason why that's important is because our ability to adapt to the changes and everything else living in ecosystems around the planet's ability to adapt to those changes is much more difficult the faster that they happen. So generally, as you look back in, in Earth history, the faster things happen, the more things die. And what we have to understand about this present moment is not only are we increasing temperatures uh, to alarming rates, but we're doing it from the perspective of Earth history at a um, race car's pace, blindingly fast relative to past uh, periods of change in Earth history. The last thing that I want to say is we projected this out to 2100. And you know, when I started working on this problem several decades ago, 2100 seemed like a long ways away. I'm certainly not going to live that long, but my children will, who are four and six, and anyone, any children 
being born today have a likelihood of living to 2100. So we've reached a point in time where we're living within a human lifetime of experiencing these changes we're projecting. This isn't now some abstract point in the distance that many of us aren't, won't see, but children being born today will likely live to 2100 and actually witness the changes that we're projecting out to that time period. So now I want to talk a little bit more about risk and what this all means. And I, the main thing that I want you to take away is that as we increase the global temperature, the risk increases in two ways. So first of all, the kinds of events that occur become more numerous. So we increase the kinds of extreme events and the, and, and the kinds of things that might be possible if we come in at a warming of four degrees C relative to one degree C. And the severity of those events will increase. So the events that we do get as we increase the amount of warming will be um, more severe, more catastrophic, and have more impact um, relative to a world that's not as warm. So the main thing to think here is that as things get warmer, risk increases as a consequence. And you know, one of the things that we're starting to understand and, and is being fleshed out is, you know, as a physical scientist like me, we can, we can show you facts and figures about temperature and how all these things are going to uh, change physically. But that of course then ripples down through all of these different socioeconomic systems that define the way that we live on this planet. It will impact migration, food, public health, education, conflict, economics, infrastructure, and ultimately the habitability of areas on our planet um, as these conditions change. And so I just wanna walk you through a few things to think about in that context. Um, Warmer global temperatures means more heat waves. And uh, there's a strong relationship between mortality and heat waves. And so this is just an example for Rhode Island of our present conditions. And these, these, these box plots here represent increases in the number of heat related ER visits per year for these different possible pathways. So it's sort of middle of the road and then here's that business as usual. And by the end of the century, we could be sending uh, Rhode Island in particular could be sending 1,500 more people to the ER due to heat related um, stressors uh, relative to what they're sending now. And a reminder that you know the most vulnerable are impacted in particular by these heat events, uh, the elderly um, and people with fewer means to, to control temperatures with uh, air conditioning or otherwise, uh, or find heat relief. And so, uh, this is also something that very disproportionately affects the population depending on ultimately uh, age or wealth. Bad news for the Northeast, I hate this one. Uh, you know, the, as you change the temperatures, as you reduce the, um, the extremeness of winter, you change the life cycles of pests like ticks and mosquitoes. And as those um, viruses or those, uh, those vectors um, can be more viable, they can have more life cycles, there can be more of them, uh, they can increase their range north. Uh, one of the things for the Northeast in particular is that we expect an increased incidence of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases, as well as West Nile virus um, as a consequence of expanding ranges of the mosquitoes that carry that virus. We also can expect stronger and wetter storms. So uh, that goes both for the kind of rain events that we might have on a typical day, to nor'easters, to uh, hurricanes that come through our region. So think about Ida or Sandy. Um, and as we warm the planet, the storms that we get are going to be stronger. We may not get more storms, but the ones that we get uh, will be stronger, higher winds, and they'll dump more uh, precipitation um, over their lifetime than what we would have experienced say a century ago before the changes that we've caused to the planet have occurred. Hurricanes and nor'easters go uh, together with sea level rise. Um, so as you have storm surges associated with those uh, storms, if the, those storms are operating on higher and higher sea levels, you have more and more inundation inland uh, as a consequence of those events. But you also have uh, damage associated with sea level rise just by the fact that um, sea levels will increase uh, in their um, height over this century. The, Modest projections right now project as much as three feet of sea level rise. We've already had about a foot on the East Coast and we can expect about three more 
um, as a conservative estimate going forward. And that happens for two different reasons. One, as you warm the oceans, they expand and that thermal expansion causes sea, sea level to rise. And as you melt uh, ice caps, as you melt ice on land, whether it's glaciers or ice caps in Greenland and Antarctica, you are taking ice that's on land and not displacing water and putting it in the ocean and increasing uh, sea level by means of putting more water in the ocean. So both of those things will cause increasing sea level rise and it'll be important for regions in the Northeast. Warming isn't just happening on land, it's also happening in the ocean. So the black dots here are increasing sea surface temperatures on the Northeast continental shelf. And uh, those temperatures are increasing. Uh, they're increasing faster than the global rate. And that has huge implications for marine life. And that's tied uh, intimately to things like the viability of fisheries throughout much of the Northeast, uh, whether it's fish populations, lobster or shellfish populations, all of those things are being impacted by increasing ocean temperatures. And just to give you a sense of the potential impacts on important industries in the Northeast, this is specifically for the Northeast. Outdoor recreation uh, industry accounts for um, over 150 billion a year in annual spend spending and more than a million jobs. Agricultural fishing and forestry accounts for more than a billion in annual, annual economic activity in the Northeast and a half a million jobs. And Northeast winter recreation specifically um, accounts for between two and a half and three billion in annual revenue and uh, 44 and a half thousand jobs. All of these, and this is not all of the industries, but when you just think about how this will, um, will trickle down through our socioeconomic systems, all of these areas are in jeopardy and potentially being negative, negatively impacted by these physical changes in the climate. And um, they will hit us in um, our pocketbooks and in the available jobs associated with these industries and have real uh, serious economic implications. If you scale out globally, uh, this is an estimate of what um, the impacts economically will be globally. Everywhere that you see red will have a negative uh, per capita GDP impact. Everywhere that you see blue will have a positive. But globally, these authors estimated that if we take that worst case scenario pathway, that by 2100, global income will be reduced by roughly 23%. Um, and that will be, that will be, you can see there are different colors of red depending on which countries you're in, but particularly in the global south, uh, these economic impacts will be some of the most severe. And so not only will it have a huge economic impact uh, globally, but those impacts will be felt unevenly. And pretty much across the board, the, what I mean by unevenly is that the poorer, more vulnerable among us will feel these impacts more severely. So this, this is really interesting in that it scales from the country to country level down to um, you know, neighborhoods and municipalities. This is a study that looked at it uh, within US counties. So what it's plotting here is the damage relative to county income and as a function of wealth of US county. So here's the poorest 10%. The damage due to uh, climate change within those communities is by far the highest relative to the more wealthy communities um, within this study. So it's also critical to remember that this is a justice issue as much as it is anything, that the um, more disadvantaged, the poor communities, in many cases, the black and brown communities within the United States, uh, the global south communities internationally will bear the largest brunt of these impacts. OK, so that's depressing. But I want to give you my uh, pitch on how to think about this and how I think we should be looking at this moving forward. So lots of challenges in front of us, but it doesn't mean the end of the world. And I'm going to date myself with a couple uh, cultural uh, touchstones to tell you how I think we should be thinking about this. So this all requires that we be smarter um, and really think about how we're responding to this. And if you're depressed by all this, I would remind you of a cartoon I used to watch when I was a kid, which was G.I. Joe, and their slogan was, knowing is half the battle. So first and foremost, we have to educate ourselves, we have to talk about it, we have to communicate with each other about what these impacts mean for ourselves and our communities. And I know it can be depressing to digest a lot of this stuff, but the first step is learning about it, educating ourselves about it, so that we can act with it. And it's, it's really fundamental that we, we educate ourselves so that we can act. So it's not that we should all um, 
you know, dep be depressed when we find out about this and go cur curl into a ball somewhere. It should motivate us to action. And that's my second cultural touchstone, which is a scene from Austin Powers. If you've seen the movie, you may remember this uh, security guard screaming his head off. Uh, you know, the camera would be right up on his face and then it would pan out and show this steamroller coming extremely slowly towards him. Climate change is kind of like the steamroller. It's a chronic threat out on the horizon that's here, but it's going to get worse with time. And our job is not, if you watch the movie, you, you may remember that the fate of the security guard was not a good one. He ultimately was run over by the steamroller. And so our purpose is not to sit and scream our heads off or, or be depressed about the challenges that are uh, facing us, but in this case, to get out of the way of the steamroller and actually be um, smart and proactive about addressing these threats that are before us. And the, the wonderful thing is, is that there's a lot at our disposal and a lot of good news. So one of the things I want to show you, you know, as terrible as 2020 was, one of the things that went unnoticed was that it was the first year that solar energy, solar electricity at utility scale became the cheapest way of generating electricity in the world. So this is a bar plot showing different energy sources, different ways of making electricity from um, geothermal, natural gas, fossil fuels. And then renewables like wind, thermal, solar, and solar. Solar photovoltaics specifically uh, were incredibly expensive in 2009, 2020. They're the cheapest uh, way of, of making energy uh, currently available. That's incredibly positive and important for how this is going to work out economically. Renewables are on the rise, not by any means as much as we would like. But if you look at this plot, this is the uh, mix of renewables starting in 1950 up through. Uh, 2020. The colors here are for different sources of energy. The renewables and, and nuclear are down here. You can see the wedge of wind and solar increasing. It's still a very small proportion, but that wedge is increasing while things like uh, coal is being reduced. Fossil gas is, has filled in for a lot of that coal, but the point here is that while we have a lot to do in terms of replacing uh, these fossil fuel sources of electricity in the United States, wind and solar and other uh, renewables are on the rise and uh, mean good things. In fact, um, our emissions are going down. So this is emissions in the United States uh, back to 1990. This is the actual uh, emissions. And then these are emissions projections um, according to the Copenhagen Accord. And uh, you can see they're going in the right direction. They're not going in the right direction fast enough. And the other uh, important facts to keep in mind is where the United States sits in the overall mix of things. So our population is about four and a quarter percent of global population. We account for, um, to this date, we've accounted for 25% of the cumulative emissions. So that small population has burned a quarter, or has contributed to a quarter of the emissions since we began burning fossil fuels. Our annual emissions amount to 30, 13% of the global emissions and our per capita emissions. So each of us emits about 16 tons of CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions over the course of a year. So that all puts us in context. If the US is doing this, it's not enough. This has to be a global effort. But in the US, United States, for instance, uh, emissions are going in the right direction. And that's good news. The other thing is that we have some of the technologies that we need for addressing this problem. This is the first direct carbon capture plant, which was built in out, just outside of Zurich, Switzerland. And so what this, is, what this machine is doing here is collectively and selectively uh, taking up CO2 out of the air. So we can actually take CO2 directly out of the air. And then what this plant is actually doing with the CO2 that it captures is putting it in these greenhouses in the background and using it to fertilize uh, the growing of plants in these greenhouses. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is a tiny uh, amount of CO2 that they're capturing, about 900 tons annually, which amounts to taking about 200 cars off the road. We are emitting over 30 gigatons of CO2 annually globally. One gigaton amounts to 170 pyramids of uh, uh, great uh, pyramids in uh, Egypt. So we're emitting 170 times over 30 uh, great pyramids of CO2 in the atmosphere annually. This is a huge problem. A hu the scale is massive. But my point here is that some of these technologies exist. We can take CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. We also know how to store it in things like geologic formations. So since 1996, the Sleipner project in uh, the North Sea 
has been sequestering CO2 in geologic formations. They basically are taking, capturing CO2 from their mining efforts and dumping it back into the geologic for, formations where they're um, extracting it. Again, a very small amount. We're just talking megatons here, not gigatons. But the point is a lot of these technologies exist. They just need to be scaled up in a way that actually makes an impact. And when, I, when I'm talking about these technologies, I'm talking about both this, the side of capturing CO2 and taking it out of the atmosphere, as well as not putting any into it to begin with through the application of things of renewable energies like solar and wind. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna do is finish with my take on what we should do. So we shouldn't curl into a, a ball. That's not an effective thing to do. And often I get the question about what can I do as an individual? And, and it's an important question to ask. We can all reduce the size of our carbon footprint. I've been working on this for decades in terms of reducing the amount of activities and consumption uh, that generate CO2, uh, switching things over to renewables, all of these things that we can do individually and you can find lots online. But we also have to recognize that this is a systemic problem. And so the idea that you or me as individuals is gonna solve this problem because of um, you know, whether or not we choose to eat a cheeseburger is really not the right way of thinking about it. In fact, it's so much not the right way of thinking about it that a lot of oil and gas companies have latched on the idea of carbon footprint as a way of deflecting blame toward the roughly 70 companies that account for such a large fraction of uh, CO2 emissions with regard to the production of their product. But where we really have to engage as individuals is through collective action. So I don't know if you have, uh, if any of you listening have kids or have read Swimmy by Leo uh, Leone, but it's a story of this fish swimmy who teaches all of his other friend fish to swim like a big fish so that they don't get eaten by the bigger fish. It's collective action. And the collective action that's necessary is all of us need to engage our communities, our decision makers, the political process to really address this problem at a systemic level. We have to engage our libraries. We have to engage our churches. We have to engage our schools, uh, our children's schools. We have to engage our local uh, politicians and decision makers to really motivate the kind of collective action that's necessary to make decisions that will have the impact to turn things around. And so my suggestion to all of you is to worry about your carbon footprint, but worry even more about how much you're engaging on this issue, bringing other people into the fold and working for systemic change across a lot of different institutions. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with a quote from uh, Tolkien from Fellowship of the Ring. And I've been thinking about this a lot because I teach a lot of undergraduate students about sustainability and climate change. And I've gone through this period of time where I felt depressed about the state of things in the world. How do I teach um, this different path forward to my students who are probably feeling just as depressed as I am about uh, the challenges that we face. But what I've come to realize and think about in that context is that an assured pathway is not what we're talking about here. Things could end up horribly and go the, the wrong direction. What we need to do is work with the urgency to make sure that doesn't happen. We need to not have hope, but courage to take on these challenges and make sure that we do take one of those more sustainable pathways. And uh, this particular quote from the Lord of the Rings sort of puts that uh, in much better words for me. So Frodo is talking to Gandalf and he says, I wish none of this had happened. Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. What are we gonna do with this time to make sure that we take a more sustainable path forward? It's all up to us to, to find the answer to that, but I'm not here with a message of hope that it's all gonna work out, but that we all need to put our shoulder to the wheel to really figure this out and make sure that the future that we construct is one that's more sustainable, more just, more equitable moving forward. So with that, I am going to open it up for questions. And I see there's some stuff in the chat. I'm gonna, um, Kathleen, I'll, I'm just gonna yeah. quit sharing yeah. my screen and then. Yeah, when we could, I have, I know I have some questions. Um, and I invited everyone to um, put any questions they have in the chat box. Thank you so much, um, Jason, Dr. Spartan. Um, this was great because it was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got a little sad. <laughs> I 
I got a little sad there, but you made a very good point about what we can do. Like there, to me, hope is that us educating ourselves and um, being more empowered to do things with information. Um, and with that said, I guess one of my questions, um, you know, someone for myself, I have a background in journalism and one of the things I see, and we, we even see in the libraries, you know, a lot of people, you know, still question this, you know, and I, I was wondering what do you, you know, why do you think personally, um, or maybe from your perspective, why do you think people um, question the science of climate change? I think that it's because a lot of people have paid a lot of money to make it an ideological issue and a political issue. Um, this is not tinfoil hat thinking. This is well documented that um, for decades now, uh, the people with the most to lose, namely the oil and gas companies, um, from a from give, transitioning decarbonizing, decarbonizing our economy, um, have spent a tremendous amount of money to lobby our political system. But this is you know this is the United States, but this is happening globally. Um, and also spread a lot of disinformation about um, this issue such that it's confused people. There's, there are uncertainties, it's a complex problem. And so, you know, they've really focused on uncertainties and really tried to confuse people about um, the scientific understanding of this, of this issue, um, but also work to make it an ideological issue. So now it's the kind of thing that, um, depending on where you are in the political spectrum, you believe in global warming or you don't believe in global warming. Mm -hmm. And that's been disastrous because yeah. this is not, the climate change will not discriminate based on whether or not you're a Democrat or a Republican in terms of the um, pain it imposes. And we need ideas from across the spectrum. This is an all hands on deck moment. We need ideas from across the spectrum uh, about how to deal with this. But if one, you know, in, in a system like the United States where one political party has created an identity around denying climate change, yeah. That you know uh, closes off as much as fifty percent of the population from participating in this discussion, um, and the Earth doesn't care whether you're Republican or Democrat as long as we keep spewing CO two into the atmosphere. Um, it's going to continue to cause problems for us. So I think I think there are people. I mean, it's not to say that people are acting cynically. The you know the person on the street may not be acting cynically in terms of what their views on climate change are, but there is a tremendous amount of disinformation. Climate change, there was disinformation out on climate change before that was the word on everybody's tongue. But you know, these campaigns have been operating well before Facebook and, and Twitter and, and other ways that we know it to operate more um, effectively now to really confuse and um, create doubt around this issue. And that's the headwinds that a scientist like me really faces. So when mm. people, oftentimes people will talk about the need for scientists to communicate more. And we do, we need to communicate more, we need to do it better, all these things. But it's not, we are not communicating into a vacuum. It's a very complicated landscape where there are a lot of people who see this issue ideologically, who have digested a lot of disinformation. Um, and so it's, it's not like we're trying to go out and educate about um, some mundane scientific topic. It's like we're going out and talking about gun control or abortion. It's, right. it's that kind of an issue now within our political landscape in the United States in particular. Perhaps maybe we could do more educated, you know, um, in the schools, maybe, maybe climate change might help. Um, Cause this is great. I mean, I think um, uh, having knowledge or learning something is just very empowering. So it's like, I don't know about everyone else um, watching this, but I, I you know, <laughs> I'm, I know I'm leaving here a little bit more um, empowered and, you know, I kind of already know like, you know, um, what to keep in mind when, you know, when the doom cloud is <laughs> is over us. Um, I, what about, do you think that, um, another question I have, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not gonna, don't be afraid everyone to, if you have any questions, just please enter in the chat box. But one of the questions, another question I have um, is, do you think climate change is like one of the greatest, um, threats to specifically to public health? I mean, I think you, you mentioned it um, in your presentation, but I'm kind of worried about what like, what worried, but or I'm thinking about, you know, public health, you know, talking about Lyme disease and everything else. 
So I think that it's a, you know, the military talks about climate change as a threat multiplier. And I think mm -hmm. that that's how you need to think about climate change and public health. There's ways in which climate change will have an impact directly through, you know, extreme events, hurricanes, forest fires. Um, but then there are other health, public health factors. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure that in Connecticut, you had the air quality that we did in New York due to the fires out West last summer. Oh, that's okay. an example of, of, you know, a climate change driven event that's being in terms of the impacts being driven as far east from the, the west as, as the east coast and impacting um, our, our air quality. But I, I think that the way to think about it is that it amplifies so many things. It didn't create Lyme disease or West Nile, but it's going to spread it and it's going to um, make it more of a public health threat than it was previously and bring it into areas that aren't used to dealing with it. There are other ways in which it can drive, it actually can, uh, well, when it's affecting vectors like mosquitoes, it can drive pandemics, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through ma malaria is connected to this as well. Um, but there are other things that may not directly be tied to climate change, but to um, unsustainable practices like development and incursion into areas that humans haven't existed in, in significant quantities before which bring them into contact with more animals. So a lot of these zoonotic diseases, coronavirus is one of them, um, have to do with humans coming in contact with animals that are carrying the virus. And as we develop and expand into uh, different areas, um, our chances of coming into contact with viruses in those areas increases. And then of course we have this global um, transportation system that mm. means those things can spread globally in a way that, you know, faster and to an extreme uh, in a way that they previously couldn't. All right, thank you. Um, any questions? I think maybe we could possibly have a live question. If you wanna, if you wanna ask a question, if you wanna raise your hand, I can allow you to talk. If you will, if not. Oh, okay. Um, go ahead, Hannah. Oh. Oh, Hannah. Hello. Oh. I just allowed oh. her to talk. Hi. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, going back to the whole school thing, how um, that I think that schools should, you know, know more about like climate change and stuff like that. Um, I'm actually doing a project on live blogging thing. So I had to sign up for a, like events and stuff like that. And I'm so glad that I signed up for this one <laughs> to learn more about it and stuff. But um, I, I think that um, colleges and, and even going back to like, you know, middle school and high school, I think that they should know this and they should, you know, be more aware of everything, you know? Um, yeah, that I, it's more of a comment, but I, I mean, I, I really do think that, you know, even, you know, colleges should know more about it, you know? Right. Thank you for your comment, Hannah. And I'll, I'll say that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's growing pressure and interest in sustainability and sustainability plans and on college campuses. So I've been involved in a lot of different uh, sustainability initiatives to develop plans to make Columbia more sustainable. When I was at Michigan, we were doing it there. Um, and that is manifest in lots of different ways through, um, you know, reducing waste, becoming more efficient, um, reducing emissions. You're also seeing a lot of activity around uh, the divestment campaigns, essentially at, at uh, universities and colleges, asking um, the, those, those institutions to divest from fossil fuels um, in their endowments. Uh, and that's gaining a lot of traction. And then there's a lot going on in the public schools as well. So we actually have in the New York public uh, school system, for instance, uh, under Bloomberg, they um, created sustainability positions within every um, New York school. And we have people working at teachers college who are networking with a lot of those sustainability coordinators at the schools to bring sustainability education, climate change education to um, the, the students as well as their families, which I think is a, is a genius uh, thing to do, you know, really engaging parents through the schools uh, to better educate around climate change and sustainability. So your, your comment is very well placed. We're not doing enough, but there is um, a lot of activity to 
to leverage education and networks within schools to learn more about these issues and, and we should continue to push. So. And I'll say just with that said, I'll just kind of want to plug in how important um, you know, your libraries are, um, your public libraries. And again, this is why um, we created this dinner disrupted series. So this is, you know, um, a great place to engage um, and to, um, you know, find programming like this. So I'm really glad that you joined us tonight, um, especially as a student. Anybody else have questions? Want to raise their hand? I am too. I'm sorry. Oh, go <laughs> yeah. ahead. Yes, please. Yeah. I'm. I. I'm very glad that I. I signed up to all, you know, um, to my teacher, props to my teacher for, you know, right. she, yeah, she sent a whole, um, your whole like event things for your library. So like, I just signed up for a bunch of them and this one, I'm very into climate change and all, Wonderful. all of it. So I was like, yes, right up my alley. <laughs> That's great. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um anybody else if, if not we can oh you know what jason i do have one question i'm sorry i'm, I'm taking it off but um who is that who was actually or this is maybe a bad question i don't know is anyone actually or maybe the companies benefiting from <laughs> from global warming from you know all this climate change? Are there people who, who benefit from them? You know, like, oh, whether it's financially or even individually, I don't know. I don't know if that's a question. <laughs> well, there, there are winners and losers. Um, okay. Certainly, you know, I mean, the, the fossil fuel companies are the most profitable companies uh, in the history of the planet. And, mm. you know, they're, they, as long as they um, delay action on uh, decarbonizing our economy, they win in the sense that they continue to make the profits from, um, you know, the product that they're selling. Yeah. What's interesting and actually, um, I think, relevant for the current geopolitical mo moment is that it is true that some of the um, more northern countries in the northern hemisphere, so if you remember that costs map I showed? Yeah. Canada and Russia. Yeah, uh, I saw that. I wrote that down. I'm like, oh, <laughs> they're yeah, and, <laughs> and there are multiple reasons for it. But I think, um, you know, a couple of things that come to mind is that it increases some of their, you know, the Arctic to exploration and mining and a lot of the kind of extractive industries that can operate in some of those areas. It's, it's not that it's not going to cost them. Some, and it's going to be difficult in the Arctic mm -hmm. for various reasons uh, to continue to do some of the things that they do. But um, you know, and, and exploration in particular in, in the Arctic Ocean, where, um, you know, ice cover is expected to diminish to zero sometime this century, it will open mm. up a lot of exploration, it will increase, it will make for more efficient shipping routes, if you can actually go uh, across the Arctic Ocean, uh, from say, uh, you know, eastern uh, Russia to uh, the west coast of the United States, for instance, through, uh, I'm sorry, that's not the West Coast, the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, the, and then some of the Northern regions become um, more agriculturally productive. So as agriculture moves North, uh, you can grow crops in, in areas where you previously couldn't grow crops. And that becomes another be benefit for some of those, um, those countries in the Northern um, section of the Northern hemisphere. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, on the whole, um, it's, it, it may not even come out to be um, it, it break even for those countries, even if they're doing better economically. Obviously, um, if these other systems are, are strained right. and you have things like um, migration pressures into your country. So that's, that's a question where, you know, in the countries that are driving because of climate shocks are driving large uh, fluxes of uh, migration. Mm -hmm. Look how much that's destabil destabilized the United States and Europe over the last uh, couple decades. And now imagine that um, enhanced due to climate catastrophes. Wow. And, um, you know, th that's where things get pretty scary and, and disruptive. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I think we'll wrap it up now. Jason, if there, anyone has any questions, 
you got a couple seconds to raise your hand. But in the meantime, I just really want to thank you, um, uh, Professor Spurden, Jason, I'm calling you every name. Jason's great. <laughs> um, Jason, um, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. I really, really appreciate your time um, and your knowledge um, that you share with us. And I know um, folks will walk away with um, good things. And I um, also want to invite folks to you know tell your friends, come back to um, our YouTube channel. We'll have this posted later. Also, the local um, Trumbull TV station will have it um, on schedule too. Um, thank you again, Jason, for your time. I really appreciate it. And I, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks to everyone who came. It was a pleasure.